Let me begin first by saying thank you to the organizers of this wonderful conference, as well as to the translators who make it available to everyone here, as well as to the Kurdish community in Hamburg for opening their homes, and to the people of Kurdistan who've been at the heart of this struggle, and to all of you as well for taking your time to be here and to bring your own contributions to this movement. <laughs> we are today at a global historical moment when people all over the world are questioning the hegemony of capitalism and the state. In place of these systems, bottom-up stateless democracy is being looked to as the primary and most legitimate means of political action. Still, there are many people who are skeptical of this vision. Most often, they argue that a cooperative society is impossible at a large scale and that the luxuries of modernity could only be ever enjoyed by a small elite. However, I think most of us here disagree with that. And indeed, if a careful reading of natural and social history tells us anything, it is that cooperation and inventiveness are the predominant tendencies of human beings. Thus, the movement we are witnessing today for bottom-up stateless democracy rests on a fundamental truth that society can be global and democratic. We are coming to understand ourselves and learning to embrace the unique human capacity to transform the world we live in. I'm being asked to pause. The first goal of my remarks today is to unpack what we really mean by bottom-up stateless democracy. Although this idea is often invoked, it is far less often explained. In what follows, I'd like to give some substance to the idea by explaining the synergy of popular assemblies and municipal confederation. It is only through a clear, shared understanding of what constitutes a real political alternative that we become poised not only to question the hegemony of the state and capitalism, but to transcend and overcome them. However, in realizing this project, we, we require far more than just structural models. We need clearly thought out strategies and a practical means of implementing them. Therefore, I would like to comment on the nature of revolution as a lived social process and note a few of the lessons that we can derive from the Kurdish movement. So, good? Right. So, let me begin by clarifying what we mean by politics uh, in this movement. By politics, we do not mean the mechanisms of bureaucratic control, nor do we mean the Shakespearean dramas of manipulation and intrigue which unfold in the gilded state houses of parliaments and nations. By politics, we mean a set of institutions that allow ordinary people to manage their collective affairs. Politics, politics in this ancient sense refers to face-to-face -face management of organically scaled human communities, settlements like towns, villages, and urban neighborhoods. Aristotle called this entity a polis. Yet this polis is far more than a space or territory. It is our ecological surroundings, our neighbors, our children, our values, and our way of life. In other words, it is a community. And thus politics is about managing such a community in a free and ethical way. 
For a politics of democratic confederalism, the most basic institution is the popular or civic assembly. Popular assemblies are regular gatherings open to all adults within a given polis for the purpose of debating and deciding on collective issues, regardless of one's ethnicity, race, or tribal status. While we enter popular assemblies with particular identities, as women, as LGBTQ, as American or Kurdish, this institution calls upon us to think and act on behalf of the community as a whole. In doing so, it transcends the false dichotomies of individualism and collectivism, of independence and dependence, of selfishness and subordination that pervade capitalist modernity. But popular assemblies are insufficient for a free society. We must bring this arrangement of shared power to a larger scale through the process of confederation. Confederations are intercommunal assemblies or councils constituted by rotating recallable delegates. Some examples of confederations throughout history include the Iroquois Confederacy of North America, the, the Kuna people of Panama, ancient Athens or, or Attica, and even here in the Baltic region with the Hanseatic League, which functioned for over a century during the Middle Ages. In crucial distinction to an electoral or parliamentary system, delegates within a confederal system are not empowered to make decisions on behalf of the community. Rather, delegates bring proposals back to the community, which then decides as a whole. The Zapatistas call delegation and other leadership roles a cargo, which literally translates to a weight or a load. That is to say, leadership is really a form of service. And I think Roel Zavetsky yesterday made some very important comments about um, the importance of rotation becoming common political sense as well. So the term democratic confederalism has arisen to describe this, this arrangement of institutions. Yet, in practice, it has two meanings. On the one hand, it's a political model. And on the other, it refers to an actual existing project for stateless democracy in the Middle East. Mr. Ojalan, in seeking an answer to the Kurdish question, arrived at democratic confederalism as a multicultural, feminist, and ecological paradigm for the region. While in many contexts, we use the phrase democrat, uh, we use democratic confederalism as a theoretical paradigm, one should point out that confederal politics exist and perhaps must necessarily exist through multiple vocabularies and local vernaculars. For instance, in the United States, the term confederalism is often met with very strong negative reactions because of its association with our civil war and the mass slavery of African peoples. When political philosopher Murray Brookshin developed his concept of municipal confederation in the 80s and 90s, he offered the terms libertarian municipalism and later communalism. And of course, confederal decision-making is known to indigenous peoples throughout the world. Yet among these various traditions, we can recognize a unity and diversity. That is, a rootedness in popular assemblies 
and in confederation and a partnership of popular assemblies. As well as forms of everyday, everyday communal belonging that transcend social differences like gender, sexuality, ethnicity, or religion. Pardon me. In short, the truly revolutionary implication of democratic confederalism is not the possibility of regional independence or autonomy, but the possibility of trans-regional communal interdependence. So this is the political model that is now available to us. But what does it mean for human beings to dismantle capitalism and the state beyond just theory? What kind of process is political revolution? Here, I'd like to appeal to the tradition of social ecology and offer that every revolutionary project is an educational project. And here, I think we can take many lessons from the Kurdish movement and the revolution and Rojava. The revolution and Rojava was possible, you know, even though it's often in the media portrayed as a spontaneous event. It was possible because the Kurdish freedom movement spent decades among ordinary people cultivating forms of local knowledge. In my experience around this movement, I've heard countless stories of fighters coming down from the mountains to speak with people face to face in villages, with farmers, with women, with the old and the young. They explain their project in a vocabulary that the people can master and understand. And as, as I understand it, Mr. Ojalan would get up or six or seven in the, or five or six in the morning, spend one hour with his doves, and then take the entirety of the rest of his day educating people. And I think, that, I think that's very important. Westerners always ask what's, why, why Ojalan, and I think you find that reason there. He believes very strongly in his fellows as agents of historical change. And for good reason. Kurds and their ancestors have been dealing with the state, or resisting the state. Since Marduk defeated Tiamat, and since Gilgamesh ventured into the forests of the north. In this context, contesting the power of the state meant drawing out practices and knowledges that were welling up within the people's historical memory. When the strength of the Syrian state came to an all-time low, the movement was poised to leverage that popular legitimacy and knowledge into popular power. This me leads me to the second lesson, which is that a revolutionary project requires that you draw from the historical and cultural conditions around you. A lot of people say that we must look to Rojava as a model. This is both true and untrue. The Kurds' historical struggle with the state has brought about many unique cultural and, and ecological forms, including village assemblies and intertribal networks 
that make Kurdistan especially fertile ground for a stateless politics like democratic confederalism. So I'm being asked to sort of move, move along. Um, but I just want to sort of note that there's a growing understanding among many academics about the evolution of the state and a dialectic between the state and stateless peoples and a growing understanding of how stateless peoples have developed cultural forms that are equipped to avoid the state. That is, throughout all of human history, human beings do not want to become parts of states. They do not want to become subjects of states. So, back in the metropolitan centers of state power, we have long been alienated from our traditional means of subsistence and self-governance. We, we are not only political subjects of the state, we are also its cultural, psychological, and emotional subjects. In this context, the kind of autonomy from the state capitalism sought by stateless peoples, such as Kurds, Zapatistas, or Basques, has little meaning. Our task can never be to be autonomous from the state, but to dissolve it from within. Bookshin was very conscious of this when developing his theory of libertarian municipalism. He argues that social radicals must enter actual existing forms of municipal governments. There, we might present ex an explicit, unyielding program to reconstitute these institutions as popular assemblies. Local political t institutions are today under the control of the state. However, they are also rooted in pre-state political forms and thus hold the potential to house an alternative system of power. So even though our histories seem lost, we too, we too have radical histories and cultural forms. The peasant and urban uprisings of a medieval Europe are often portrayed as unstructured, spontaneous results, revolts. But a more careful reading of these rebellions reveal that they were in fact often tied to highly organized communitarian entities that ferociously opposed the consolidation of state power. All over the world, you can find histories of popular governance, like the Hanseatic League. And although no single history is perfect or without contradictions, their revival is essential to making democratic confederalism intelligible and appealing to ordinary people. So now is the time to unearth and cultivate them. So. To conclude, let me emphasize that the revolutionary task at hand is not simply to create marginal, isolated alternatives. Rather, rather, it is to create a coherent, interdependent movement for global liberation from capitalism, patriarchy, racism, and the state. In Manifesto for a Democratic Society, Mr. Ojalan critiques the feminist, ecological, and cultural movements in the United States and Europe as fragmentary and incoherent. He writes, they resemble the nestling partridges, that's little birds like, like pigeons, 
that have just escaped modernity's iron cage. We are constantly worried about when and where they will be hunted down. But they are important movements of hope. They will have much to contribute when the main alternative movement has developed. We must today become that main alternative movement. A humanity split and divided by capitalism and the state must today act like two great waves crashing together. Although the politics of democratic confederalism will go by many names in the long durée, that is in the long term, there is little difference between movements for regional autonomy like the Kurdish movement or little partridges escaping their iron cages. There is only humanity coming to terms with itself, engaging in a process of collective authorship over our interdependent future, and expanding and enhancing the human capacity to transform the world that we share. Thank you.